Hello and we welcome to our weekly partial Shear with the commentary of the Al Shukha Kodesh. Um, this week's uh, Shear is, is in the, a sponsored for the Rufu Shalema of a very sweet young man. I've asked you to daven for him before, um, father of a young family who's really not doing as well as we all want him to be doing at the moment, Rufal Chai Ben Sarim. He should have a complete Rufu Shalema and our Shear together should be contributory to that uh, much desired outcome. If you would like your the weekly Pasha Shear with the commentary of the Alshak dedicated for somebody for Rufu Shlema or to celebrate a Simcha or for any other good Jewish reason, then please just send me an email at yy at askrabbiyy.com. Yy at askrabbiyy.com. And so we we'll get straight into the into the commentary of the Alshak on this week's Pasha, which is Pasha of Nossa. To set the scene, and as we've just uh, I just returned from Miami, Florida with the young Israel of um, Val Harbor. I uh, had a very, very enjoyable time. Met lots of really fabulous people. Um, but when I was there, uh, I spoke three times. Coming back at the end of Shavuos is an, an essentially coming back into the normal world. But let's investigate that for a little bit. Let's pause. The normal relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people is usually, uh, the imagery we're given is a father to a son, father to a daughter, uh, Avinu Malkeinu. Now there are many, many uh, relationships and uh, models which the Torah and the Talmud offer, but the most general one, the most common one is a father and a child. And there's something very important in that imagery, and that is that a father and a son, the relationship is essentially unbreakable. And that, I can give you an example of that. It's one of the most, uh, one of my uh, favorite stories. Um, and it occurred many, many years ago in Manchester when I was uh, living there. I traveled down to London to speak in the largest synagogue in London, which is called Kinloss Garden Synagogue. I've spoken there many times um, over the decades. And I can't remember what organization I was speaking for, but it was, if I remember, if I remember rightly, it was a while ago, so maybe my memory is playing tricks. But I think a thousand people uh, in the, the main hall, and it could easily be, it's a, lar a large show. And um, after I finished speaking, as is normally the case, the MC, uh, the chairman of the evening, uh, thanks, thanks me, thanked me, uh, and then invited anybody who had, uh, wanted uh, to raise a question to put up their hand. They time, I think, for four or five. And so four or five hands went up, I answered them, and then I was thanked again, people dispersed. And inevitably, people who want to speak to me privately gather around to, to fire questions on what I've spoken about or whatever <coughs> to me. And I noticed at the corner of my eye, there was a fellow, I would say about 50, who was standing at the edge of the crowd, clearly waiting uh, for everybody to, to go so he could speak to me in complete privacy. And when he did so, he said, Rabbi Rubinson, uh, you said you live in Manchester. I said, yes, that's true. And he said, which part of Manchester do you live in? And I said, I live in Broughton Park. And he said, is that next to Prestwich? I said, yes, it's the adjoining neighborhood. And he said, do you know And He mentioned somebody by name. And I said, yes, I know him. How's he getting on? He asked. And I said, how's he getting as far as I know? He's doing fine. And then he said, and how many kids does he have these days? Said, kids? I said, um, I think it's two girls and a boy. And I said, and what does he do for a living? And I said, um, I have to think about that one a bit more. I, I think he's in insurance. Yes, I'm almost sure he's in insurance. And then they asked me another question. I didn't have the answer to that one. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I countered with the inevitable, inevitable question of my own. How come you know him? And he looked at me, and then he looked down at the floor, and in a very, very little voice, he said, he's my son. And I said, forgive me asking, but how come you don't know how many grandchildren you have? And so he told me a story about uh, a classic story about a teenage rebellion and how the, his wife, mother and father, tried everything to get the, bo the boy back on the straight and narrow and everything had failed. And then one night, this father made a mistake. And of course, all fathers make mistakes. I'm a father. Um, Shlomo Melech famously says, um, in Sadiq but Oros. There's no such thing as a Sadiq in the entire world who doesn't make some mistakes. Well, I'm hardly a, a, a Sadiq, but as a parent, all parents make mistakes. Uh, if you're a parent, that will ring a bell. If you're a child, you'll remember your parents' mistakes. 
and probably be quite critical until you become a parent yourself and realize it may be not quite so easy. But everybody makes mistakes, and parents make mistakes too. The father made a mistake. He lost his temper. They screamed at his son, get out, get out, and don't set foot over my front door again. And so 17 years later, how many children does he have? So I said to him, look, I can't pretend that I know your son very well, but I think I know him well enough to be able to tell you that he'd like to see his father again. And he said, oh no, too much water has flowed underneath the bridge. And I said, well, look, how about if you give me your, your phone number and your address, and how about every month or so I send you a report as to how your, how your family's doing, how your son's doing? He liked the idea. So I took his details, got into the car, and drove the rather monotonous and hardly scenic route back from Manchester, uh, from London to Manchester, which in those days took, took about three and a half hours, and arrived in Manchester. And the next day, by coincidence, I bumped into his son, because you can always arrange a coincidence. And I said, hi, how are you doing? He said, fine. I said, you know, I was just down in London and I bumped into somebody there who knows you very well and was asking after you. He said, who? I said, your father. And he said, how's he getting on? I said, well, he seems to be doing okay, but I think he'd be doing a lot better if he could see his son again. And he said, wait for this one. Oh no, too much water has flowed underneath the bridge. Like father, like son. And uh, I said, look, by coincidence, I'm going back down to London again tomorrow. Not a coincidence. How about if I take you in to see your father? I go with you to see your father. And he hesitated. And so I, as I say in, as I say in Latin, carpe diem, we spoke about that in the year recently. I chapped a wine. I, I grabbed the moment and I said, good, I'm going to pick you up at 10 o'clock. And I'm going to take you to see your dad. I started to walk back to my car. And he started to walk with me and he started to say something. And I, I said, sorry, I, I'm really in a rush. I've got to say a sheer jumped into the car, <laughs> zoomed off. Went home, picked up the phone and dialed the father and said, Mr. Katzenelen Bogan, obviously it wasn't his name. Uh, Mr. Katzenelen Bogan, it's Rabbi Rubenstein here. And I said, oh yes. I, I think he assumed that I was about to give him a report uh, about his son. I said, will you be home tomorrow by any chance around about two o'clock? He said, yes. I said, good. I'm bringing your son to see you. And he started to say something, said, I'm terribly sorry. I've got to say a share and hung up. So I picked the son up at 10 o'clock and we drove down to London. And that monotonous three and a half hour drive through the less than pretty scenery that I alluded to before seemed to have magical powers, as they say in Hebrew, kavitsa zaderach. We got in the car and suddenly, instantaneously, we seemed to be there. We got out of the car, which parked outside the father's house. We walked up the pathway towards the front door. I rang the doorbell. He was too nervous, literally shaking. Uh, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. There was no answer. So I rang it again. Still no answer. And I started to, my heart started to sink when I thought perhaps the, the father has uh, decided against this reunion. Uh, and then, just as I was about to ring it again, behind the glass, the frosted glass panel in the door, I could see a shape approaching. Uh, and then the door opened. And there was the father looking at his son, whom he hadn't seen for 17 years. There was tears streaming down the father's face. Tears streaming down the son's face. Down his cheeks. Tears streaming down my cheeks. The, the son took one step towards his daddy and his daddy rushed out and folded him in a, in a big hug, which was reciprocated and it lasted a very long time. And then together they walked in arm in arm and I was wonderfully and gloriously redundant. So I said that uh, I'd be back in two hours and went to visit my own family in the Golders Green area of London. And I uh, came back and picked him up and took him back to Manchester. And within, within, Six months, that fellow had sold his house, sold his business, and relocated back to London, uh, buying a house only four streets away from where his father lived so that his children could see their grandparents growing up. The relationship between a father and a son or a father and a daughter is exactly like that. 
no matter how bad the relationship has deteriorated, no matter what the son or her daughter has, has done, effectively, the, the father or mother wants to hear that knock on the door and open it to find the estranged child waiting outside. You're guaranteed that you're going to be taken back in. And that's the model, that's the relationship that we have when it comes to a father and a son, Hashem and the Jewish people. And that was the relationship we had up until Shavuos. But when we come to Shavuos, then the relationship changes. Then the paradigm there is not a father and a son, but a husband and a wife. And the relationship between a husband and a wife is totally different because innately in the nature and the DNA of a parent and a child, uh, the, the parent, they never let go. Uh, but in the relationship of a, a husband and a wife, it's different. In fact, in my <coughs> shelves over there, I can't quite see it, I don't want to change the, uh, the angle of the camera, you forgive me. Uh, but if you look at the, the volumes of the Talmud in correct uh, order, you'll find that the one uh, on divorce, Gitin, comes before the one on marriage, Kedushin. And the reason is you have to know how to get out of a mess before you get yourself into one. So if we're now changing the paradigm and changing the model, that we're basing our relationship on of the Jewish people to Hashem to be now a husband and a wife, Hashem being the husband, the Jewish people being the wife. What happens if the wife is unfaithful, uh, is adulterous, cheats, and uh, reneges on the deal? Well, as I said, it normally it is the case that in, in, when it comes to a get, uh, it's, it's something that comes before condition. You have to know how to get out of it. But more than that, if a woman is hal halakhically, if a woman commits adultery and the husband knows about this, it is confirmed. And even if he wants to forgive her, and even if she's 100% sincere in her regret uh, over uh, the things that she did wrong, and he wants to carry on and get the, the marriage back on track, he can't. Halakhically, he has to divorce the wife. So if we are the wife, Hashem is the husband, and we commit adultery, as we did almost immediately after that, that ketubah, that uh, marriage contract was exchanged at Mount Sinai, and if, if you remember, it's 613 conditions in it, um, given by Hashem, we accepted it straight after that. We were unfaithful when we committed adultery with uh, a golden calf, um, and the famous, the famous story of the golden calf. Uh, the first act of adultery, but all the way through Tanakh, many of our greatest prophets uh, compare us to an unfaithful wife. So does that mean to say that the, 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 the relationship has, has changed? And the answer is no. At the end of Parsha Bechel Khoisai, which we, of course is the culmination of the book of the Yikra, we, co we covered that just a, a couple of weeks ago, leading in just on the approach to, uh, to uh, Shavuos, and Hashem says right at the end, I'll never forsake you. You may walk away from me, but this is a special marriage, a marriage which does not operate under the normal laws of marriage, which force, compel a husband to divorce the wife if she committed adultery. Hashem says, I'm never letting you go. Essentially, the same relationship, the father and son, is the husband and wife relationship when it comes to Hashem as well, when it comes to the Almighty. However, it's important to bear in mind that we're now post Shavuos, we've now left Mount Sinai, and we're walking back into, into normal, as I said before, the normal year as the wife, the Jewish people now being the wife, the bride of, of Hashem. That's something that needs to be addressed a little bit. You see, a marriage, as we all know, the, the cliche says marriages are made in heaven, and of course they are. Cars in America used to be made in Detroit, uh, I believe they're now made in California, if they're Teslas. Uh, I don't know where they're all made, but you get the idea. Once you've got a car, um, even though you've got it, you have to service it. You have to make sure it's in good condition. Sometimes you have to invest in it, buy new parts, put new parts into it, introduce new things to it um, that are absorbed by it in order to keep the car running smoothly. It's the exact same thing when it comes to a marriage. I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you, but one of the, um, of all my, really now quite long career at speaking at places all over the place, places all over the place, that sounds bad, places all over the world, that sounds even worse, but when I was in Miami or wherever, my two, I think in my top five uh, events is when I, when I went to Camp Simcha uh, in London. It's uh, run by Mr. and Mrs. Plancy, 
I wrote about them in my book, Truly Great Jewish Women Then and Now. Um, and uh, Mayor Plancy, uh, he's the son of uh, Rabbi Plancy, who was originally from Glasgow in Scotland, like myself, and he plays the bagpipes remarkably well, unlike me, um, who plays them very badly. But basically, um, so basically these, this couple just got involved in helping very, very sick kids. And it grew into this huge, wonderful, wonderful organization. And before COVID, I can't remember, many years ago, it was seven years ago, something like that, um, I was invited, I was truly honored to be invited to come to speak at one of their uh, weekend retreats. So they have three in the year. Um, one is for uh, non-from couples. Um, so they need a different dynamic. Um, one is for families dealing with children with cancer, and one is uh, for families dealing with worse diseases than cancer. And there are many worse diseases than cancer, because very there are a, a really increasing number of childhood cancers which are curable. Uh, and I use the word curable in the literal sense, not that rather um, less than satisfactory word um, remission, which suggests a temporary victory, but a total victory, not just winning a battle, but winning a war. And that is cured, like childhood leukemia. But there are other diseases which have no cure. And at this second, so the camp that I was invited to speak at, um, then the, uh, the children there had other diseases, in fact, worse diseases than cancer. Diseases that have no um, uh, happy medical uh, resolution to them. And it was astonishing. I remember this. Uh, very clearly the first time I went, I was invited twice. I, I was the only rabbi, I think, to be invited twice and, and one year after the other, which was a huge compliment. But anyway, so basically when I was there, I had a huge hall in a hotel about an hour north of London. And the atmosphere was fabulous. You would never realize that at these tables, these parents with these kids, these kids were so very, very sick. There was one woman standing there, a bit like the Statue of Liberty with her hand in the air and just holding a, a, a a plastic bag filled with white liquid, and the tube going from that liquid into a little boy's stomach. That's how he, fed, he was fed. And it, nobody blinked, nobody batted an eyelid. That was just normal. Anyway, at this uh, event, if I remember rightly, I had to speak five times, it might have been four, I can't, something like that. But it bore Hashem with tremendous help from Hashem, Siata de Shmaya, as they say. Um, then it was successful, and the woman asked for a second session, which took it up to, I think, six, and uh, and that was successful as well. And after, or towards the end of Shabbos, Mrs. Plancy, um, who is a, a, a koyach, uh, a tremendous person, she said, would I um, uh, mind speaking to some of the couples privately, because a, a lot of them had asked for private sessions, and in fact, 14 couples wanted to speak to me. Now, if I remember rightly, Shabbos went up at seven. By the time you've got Havdalah, et cetera, then it's going to take us to eight. And you wouldn't be, need to be a, a mathematical or arithmetical genius to work out. But that's just a tiny bit tricky. Um, how are you going to get 14 people in? Because eight to 12? Mm -hmm. uh, how many can you, can you see? Let's say I'm able to stay awake to, to one. But Mrs. Plancy said, I'm going to tell every single one of them they've got 20 minutes and no more. Uh, and that way we've got to see almost all of them. Uh, 20 minutes. And it was a bit like, I felt actually a bit like a doctor. Because normally when you go and see a rabbi, um, then it's basically, you know, just carry on and go on for an hour more until people explain the situation. I mean, you might have to come back. But as maybe people watching this or listening to this will know if you've ever been to see a psychologist or a therapist for, for all sorts of things, very often they have a clock sitting there um, on the desk. Your sessions from 12 o'clock to, to 12.30. As soon as you walk in, hello, click. They, they start the clock running. And when it comes 30 minutes later to 12.30, click. Well, that's the end of this week's session. No, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling suicidal. Yes, yes, we'll talk about that next week. I, I might not be here. Like, no, okay, see you next one. And then you come. But that's not how it works with rabbis. But now this is how it was working. Mrs. Plancy had said 20 minutes and 20 minutes it was. So in came the first couple. And it was a young couple. Actually, I, I, I knew um, her, I think, maybe both of them. She certainly beat my shimmer. 
um, this young lady, and the, spent the first 10 minutes telling me exactly and precisely what was wrong with her child. And it was pretty dramatic. And then again, that Seattle de Shmaya Award phrase that I used before, that tremendous uh, uh, help that you get from heaven, uh, came into play. Uh, one of the, uh, a Yiddish word for an idea is an einfall, something that literally falls in. And I had an einfall, or an idea, or rather I was given the idea. So after they finished telling me about their, their, their uh, little boy, um, I said to them, and how's your marriage? Now, I don't know if you are, have ever been um, in the situation. Maybe you're a pedagogue, maybe you're a teacher. Very often a teacher brings in two boys, or make it boys, I suppose it could be girls as well, and uh, they've done something wrong, and the teacher or the principal says, okay, tell me precisely what happened. And the two little boys are sitting with this, and they're trying to communicate, but they can't possibly look at each other. They, sometimes their eyes go round, but they can't quite swivel. Um, and so that's what the situation was for this couple. How's your marriage, I said. And they both sat there, a bit like a deer in the headlights, you know, um, frigid, rigid. And their eyeballs trying, trying to communicate. And then event, after this moment, a few moments of hesitation and squirming, um, then they both started to speak at the exact same moment. And the, the lady said, great. And the husband said, awful. And then she looked around at him, and then she looked back at me, very defensive, and said, we're not on the rocks, you know. And I said, my dear young lady, I don't think for one moment that you're on the rocks. It's just that you and your husband are under such stress and dealing with such dramatic circumstances that that stress must be making a, a huge impact in your marriage. Who else are you going to shout at, shout at when you're angry, when you're upset, then you, the person who lives with you? Uh, the stress is absolutely enormous. Now, at this point, I said to them, remember, Mrs. Plancy is going to open that door in five minutes and throw you out, because doctors have, in the UK, I think it's 10 minutes, are allotted for each consultation. I think in the States it's 15 minutes, maybe wrong. We had 20 minutes, but certainly it was shortly going to be worse. I said, I feel a little bit like a doctor. So I had a notepad there. So I said, in that case, I'm going to give you a prescription. So I folded the paper, cut it in half, took out my pen and started to write. And this said, I said, this is your prescription. And I wrote down, you will go out together every single week without fail for a date night. You will not take your mobile, your cell phone with you. You will Go to a nice place and remind yourselves of how much in love and how happily married you were before this tragedy of a very sick old child entered your life. And I signed it. Dr. Rubenstein handed the piece of paper and the husband said, don't take my cell phone. What if there's an emergency? I said, you're not listening to me. I said, don't take your cell phone. You can take a cell phone. So if it's your mother or your father or the wife's mother or father is looking after your, your son or whoever it is, they've got your number, but it's a number that you only use on those occasions. Buy a new cell phone, get a burner phone, whatever you like, or maybe they'll give you yours, uh, theirs for you to use, but that phone, only the person looking after your son uh, will have that number. And if there's an emergency, indeed there's an emergency, and then their life that's an extremely common occurrence, then you will simply jump in your car and rush back. But apart from that, you won't, nobody will have a whole lot of access to you. You'll just remind yourselves of how happily married you are, you were, and you still are, and how much love you are with each other. And you won't talk about this situation. Just recapture the love and the passion and the, and the dedication you had just a little while ago. And off they went. In came the next couple, sat down, spent about five to ten minutes telling me about the terrible situation they were dealing with. And then I said, and how's your marriage? And the exact same thing. And this played out through all the couples that came to see me. And then I was very, very blessed and very fortunate that the Plancy's invited me back to speak again the following year at Camp Simcha. And uh, many, I think all actually, of those couples came to tell me how my prescription uh, of the date night had been a tremendous success. He said, the point is that when you have a marriage, 
it has to be, as I said before, you have to keep it going. You have to remind yourself of that relationship, how much love was there before you got distracted by a thousand different things. And when we leave Mount Sinai, when the new relationship is stated to be a husband and a wife, this is our date night. Once a year, the Jewish people have a whole festival dedicated to rekindling that relationship between a husband and wife, between Hashem and ourselves. We have to remind ourselves before we made mistakes. There's a tremendously interesting al saying this is a shir on the al And the al is, uh, here's the al on the in Tanakh. And the al this is a very, very famous posik in Yermio. It's a chapter base and posik base, so it's very easy to remember. And he says the following thing. Zacharti uh, loch chesed I remember about you, the chesed, the kindness of your youth. Ahabas klalasayach, the love you bore me like a kala. To follow me into the desert, to a place where there's no food, no resources, but you were so absolutely devoted to me, besotted with me, Jewish people, kala, I'm the chosen, says Hashem. That's what you were willing to do. And it's interesting, the al says that it's the way of an ahava kadosha, of a new love, that no matter where the chosen is going, the Kala is going to. The Kala is going to. Um, I, I saw this very often when I used to teach in the Bay Sorosheneros Seminary, Girls Seminary in Manchester, um, that one of the girls went away for a week down to London, perhaps, uh, to look after a, a, a grandmother, a Bobby. Mm-hmm. Everybody knew exactly why she'd gone to London. It was a Shidduch. And then after a week or so, then the, the news filters up to Manchester that the girl is Kala. And then a few days later, she returns to seminary in a, a classic British black taxi, those black things, I'm sure you've seen them, a little sort of like box type thing, lots of room inside, good fun. Um, the taxi pulls up outside the, the seminary, a uh, little taxi driver, often Pakistani or so, um, uh, suddenly finds about 100 girls rushing down the driver of the seminary, screaming in excitement and dancing with kiddos round and round and round the taxi. And he's totally baffled by this. Don't do a scratch my taxi. Um, and then eventually they take the girls' bags, they dance her into the seminary, and they dance for another hour. Eventually they all gather around her and they want to know all about the boy. Uh, what's, what's his name? Shimon. Shimon, I don't know, choose a name, Bernstein. Shimon Bernstein, where from? Gold is green in London. Ooh, where, 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 where is he learning? Ponovich. Ooh, Ponovich, that's good. Ponovich, Shiva. good. Or Mir. Right, and uh, after the marriage, oh, when's the mar- when you get married? Three months time. Uh, after the marriage, he's going to carry on learning in Kabul. Kabul, where? Wonderful, where? <laughs> Siberia. Siberia, say the girls, in disbelief. And the Kala, beaming, smiling, her head up. Yes, Siberia. Siberia, Russia? Yes. Um, and of course, the girls are all very polite, but being British, but they think she's completely off her head. Um, but it says the al is the way of an Ahava Kadasha. You love whatever the Chosen is going, the Kama is going to. After a few years of marriage, however, the circumstances change. Then the uh, husband announces to his wife, Dear, uh, honey, um, I've just been given a great job offer in Manchester or Baltimore, if you're American. And the wife says, Manchester? Baltimore? You think I'm going to move from London or New York? Are you crazy? I'm not going to these places. Um, what happened to the Ahava Kadosha? You, you see, you've got to work at keeping that passion alive. It's, it's got to, you ought to remind yourself. Um, you've got to have a date night. Um, and the passion that we felt and rekindled, hopefully over Shavuos, uh, when you were uh, in that state of mind, that's what we're trying to recapture all the time. So, uh, when we come to this week's Parsha, uh, the Parsha talks about, indeed, a woman, and also a woman who committed adultery. Uh, Hashem gives a whole formula uh, of the nausea, which is apparently part of the antidote, because as Rashi says, he can only imagine, why is the juxtaposition between nausea and the, and the nausea? Because um, the woman only committed adultery because she'd been drunk. She lost, she, she lost her clarity, she lost her mind. So to avoid that happening, then, was the concept of the nausea. Fine. 
However, uh, this year, I want to read to you, unlike last year, a different aspect of the al set. So I'll read this a little bit to you. Now, we all know, of course, the nausea is somebody who um, has to uh, keep away from dead bodies. He has to uh, keep away from wine and he has to keep away from cutting his hair. The normal period of, of volunteering to be a nausea is a period of a month. And a woman can volunteer to be a nausea too. Um, and when you do that, then there are also some restrictions about coming near dead bodies, including from members of your family. The exceptions to the nausea when he is allowed to is the exact same exceptions of a Cohen goggle, not just of a Cohen, because a Cohen can violate his the prohibition of a Cohen coming into contact with a dead body if it's for a very near relative, like a, like a, like a, like a, um, a father or a mother. Um, but not for people who are further away. That's the exact same thing when it comes to nausea, but not just of a, of a koan, but a koan godl. And the Alshik says the following thing. He says, Omnam hine, Ratsa Kodesh Baruch Lamad Das as Amo Yisrael em Ankamsha. The Rabbana Shalom, through the device of the nausea, wants to teach the Jewish people something very important. Because just like we have to put work into our relationship, Hashem wants to make sure that the relation, we are on, we are on board and we understand how he's looking at us too. Baal Yomer no Yisrael, the Jewish people should not say, Hello, who is Baruch Hebdel Eshevet Levi? Now, of course, and Bamibar, and at the beginning of Parshas Nosa, we're talking, it begins with talking about the Levim, the unique and specific role that the Levim have in, in, uh, in, in within the Jewish people. Uh, and of course, the Kohenim have, and, the, and the, within, the, within the Mishkan, setting up the Mishkan, etc. Uh, this is unique roles. However, he says, you might think, therefore, Shem has set them aside. And from Shevet Levi, then, was children of Aaron, the Kalanim. And then the Kalan Godel, the, 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 the pinnacle of that, of that hierarchy, is, of course, the Kalan Godel himself. He called us Yomer Loi, and he's called a holy person. But that seems to look, it looks as though, therefore, Kedusha, holiness, prestige in the eyes of God seems to be a hereditary process. If you're a son of Aaron, if you're a direct descendant of Aaron, uh, a Levi or a Kohen, etc., then you are automatically the, uh, the elite of the Jewish people. Nonsense, says the Alshach. It looks as though it's hereditary, and not that a person gains stature, gains uh, kudos and honor and holiness through his or her choices. In order that you shouldn't think such a thing, which is anathema to Judaism, anathema to Torah. That's not the case. A person can reach the highest spiritual levels, separate themselves from all the hedonism and all the materialism and all the physicality of this world. Well, the Kaddishat Smoy and make him or herself truly a holy person, through their choice, through their attachment to physical growth, spiritual refinement, Kaddish And through that process, they'll be called a Kaddish. And through the, pro and through the process of being a Nazar, you're called Kaddish. Okay, Khan Godel, and not just Kaddish, but like a Khan Godel, a Shalom, Yitama, Obib, who cannot be. Contaminate or be contaminated in the contact of a dead body, even for his mother and father. An ordinary Kohen can, uh, but not the Kohen Godel. Gamal Yashav, and he can reach the highest height, highest heights. Kohen Godel Aleho because the Kohen Godel has got the the oil, the anointing oil in his head. It's something external went in him, but the growth of the hair is to symbolize that the holiness comes from within. The nausea, not something that was put on his head, oil that anointed him, but rather it's something that he grew from inside him. It came spontaneously from inside him to become the Kohen Godel, uh, to become, sorry, become the nausea, like the Kohen Godel. The Kohen Godel, it's appointed, it's a given. But uh, an ordinary Jew, a he or a she, can reach the same level as the Kohen Godel through their choices. In fact, the Gomorrah famously says, Kohen Godel Amo, or it's Manzer Talmud Koch. The Kohen Godel can be a complete ignoramus. However, a Manzer, obviously, somebody whose, whose origins are not so fantastic, 
um, uh, can reach the highest spiritual heights. The highest spiritual heights, the greatest honor any Jew can have is through the Torah, is mastering the Torah, is internalizing the Torah, making the Torah part him or her. And that's freely available to everybody. And that Hashem wants you to know. You're my Kala. And don't think that, you know, I needed to buy somebody who I would buy. So I needed to marry somebody who was, you know, from such a great family. In fact, the Jewish people, when he marries us, we were, wow, we're just out of rehab, literally out of rehab. We had seven weeks of rehabilitation, of rehab from, from its tribe, and he marries us. In fact, the world would probably turn and say, why, why then? In fact, we know the Malach of Mitzrayim said, why then? Why? They're just as bad as my people. But Hashem has got absolute commitment to the Kala, and that's us, and therefore it's appropriate for us to bear that in mind. And he makes that clear to us. You can reach the greatest spiritual heights in the whole of the Jewish people. If you think of the greatest of the Jewish people, men and women, and of course from Rus that we just read about, um, Rochov, and so many others, Avram Avinu, the background he came from, people who came from terrible backgrounds, went on to achieve the greatest and be brides of, of, of Hashem as well. So that's a very important message to move forward with. So um, we will come back to our, our Alshad next week. I wish you all a great Shabbos, a great Shabbos, and I look forward to learning some more Alshad with you um, next week. Good Shabbos.